my friends. I am Corey Shockey, the Deputy Director General of the International Institute for Strategic Studies. Thank you so much for coming to be part of this conversation today. The, we at the IISS have a research program for the next couple of years that is organized around three strains of inquiry. One is about war, the second is about power, and the third is about rules. And one of the rules of the existing international order that we are trying to explore is what does the return of great power competition mean? And we have the great good fortune that today uh, a great friend of this institute, Dr. Aaron Simpson, has come to have an argument with me about this. <laughs> That's not what I came to do, <laughs> but it might happen anyway. Erin holds a PhD from Harvard. She was a senior advisor uh, in Afghanistan. She ran a, a consultancy called Saris Karis. I always say it wrong. Which is it? Karis. Karis. Um, she's an outstanding leader, an outstanding scholar, and she also works in the strategy shop at Northrop Grumman. Dr. Simpson, thank you for coming back once again to the IISS. Tell me how we should be thinking about great power competition. Oh, no, I, I came so that you would tell me. Um, I only have questions, <laughs> really. Um, and I, I should say that I'm here very much in my personal capacity. Perhaps I speak for my podcast, but I definitely don't speak oh, for I'm very my employer. Lead. She is also the anchor of the very best podcast out there. A drunken revelry called <laughs> Bombshell, which is the sisterhood talking serious national security strategy. Go. It's fabulous. Um, it is. So I, I guess maybe we can start with kind of how my brain started moving on these things and we can move into kind of an informal conversation about them, which is... You know, most of the strategy documents in the U.S. at this point, um, you know, it's strategic competition. Like, great power competition is back, and people are, like, so relieved, right? We get out of these terrible wars. We've got the big stuff. It's, you know, much more fun that way. But my, what I, as we're reading through, it's both in the U.S., like, national security strategy and the national defense strategy, but it's also just sort of, I don't know, in the air in, in Washington, um, my first thought was actually, like, do we actually know how to compete anymore? Um, the U.S. has uh, enjoyed or wasted, depending on how you think of it, a somewhat of a unipolar moment for 25 uh, years. And I get the sense whenever we sort of talk about like rising China or kind of growing, you know, threats from other, you know, sort of nation states, uh, we get into like a panic. And so it's like... I don't know, you're in the bottom of the eighth inning, up by six runs, your opponent actually scores twice, and what do you do? Well, so I'm going to translate all of I this. I can tell you one thing you should do, which is, uh, as I have learned to my enormous grief and my disappointment that there is actually a rules-based international order where people understand baseball metaphors, mm -hmm. the, the liberal order doesn't extend this far across the Atlantic, Karen. <laughs> You've got to translate it, man. Well, I did the baseball <laughs> analogy just for you, but in preparation, I have translated it into footy, and so instead, <laughs> it would actually be that you are into extra time, up 5-0, opponent scores two goals, and so what do you do? You transfer the striker, you sack the manager, and sell the team to a foreign billionaire. Um, How'd she do, folks? Is that comprehensible to you? Okay. <laughs> All of which are like massive overreactions and deeply astrategic is, is the point. <laughs> Thank you. That's, that was the moral of the story. Okay, so, so I'm not... I'm unsure that we actually know what competition means. Like, we think that competition means just being really, really far ahead indefinitely and with kind of a minimal amount of effort. And I don't think that's what competition is actually going to feel like in the 21st century. Um, but the second bit, whenever you have these conversations, it's like, oh, but competition, we know about that. That was the Cold War. And so we want this new bout of major power competition uh, to look like the Cold War. Um, two big countries competing, this must look like that. And my both gut reaction, but also even just like the most basic amount of kind of research and analysis will suggest that this is in fact not at all like that. Um, U.S. relationship with the Soviet Union, one sort of comes out of World War II with very little 
actual prior interaction. There had been very little diplomatic interaction. The Soviet Union, following its own revolution, was quite cloistered um, and paranoid, and by definition didn't participate in the kind of liberal trading order or capitalist system after the war. Um, that left the U.S.-Soviet relationship to sort of be defined by military competition, and in particular this kind of outsized role of, of nuclear weapons. Um, that's not how I would describe the relationship with China, uh, which obviously is somewhat fraught between the U.S. and China, at least at, at the moment. Uh, but China, of course, is deeply integrated into the global economy, um, has something like 480,000 foreign enterprises operating in China. U.S. companies generated like 450 to $500 billion of revenue in China itself. Those are not just from terms of interdependence, but actual, there's just a lot of back and forth that goes on between not just the U.S. And, and China, but obviously China and the entire rest of the world. I mean, it's completely integrated into global supply chains and other forms of, of transactions. And so that's a set of relationships that's not characterized by military competition. Uh, obviously, China is a nuclear weapons state, but mostly has focused on minimal deterrence, um, and has a much, much, much smaller arsenal. I mean, literally fractions of what we were talking about with the Soviet Union in the Cold War. And so just the sort of baseline nature of that relationship strikes me as quite different than anything we might have seen um, in the Cold War, where you had really, I mean, the Soviet Union was really just an autarkic economic enterprise. I mean, it was by definition not plugged into the rest of the world. So, okay, so then we kind of get to, if it's not the Cold War, but there's still competition, what are we left with? And luckily for you, what we're left with is the late 19th century. Uh, <laughs> True. Uh, and so I've never been a huge fan of the kind of like rising power literature, uh, which at least the political science version of which can be uh, a little stilted. Uh, Not true. <laughs> but the late 19th century provides a pretty fertile playground as you look at both the rise of the United States, uh, but also Germany. Um, as, play, as states that are economically vibrant, growing, uh, and increasingly connected to trading partners and whatnot. Um, there's actually been a lot of good stuff. Obviously, Corey's book uh, is on this. On the U.S. side, um, David Edelstein's book is quite good on it the German good. question. Um, I mean, you wouldn't think that, like, the regulation of radios would be that interesting, but the British and the Germans are trying to use international rules for regulating what ships at sea use what radio system, and it's a great example of sort of how these questions of you know, power and rules inter intersect. Um, and it's kind of the last, I mean, I guess the, the interwar years are multipolar, but it's a pretty dynamic multipolar period at the end of the, of the 19th century. Uh, so for me, as I was kind of working through different pieces, thinking about what I wanted to, to say in this discussion, it came back to it really comes back to this, these underlying questions of what is the relationship between economic strength and military power? How much of that is rising tide lifts all boats, and how much of that does become deeply zero-sum at some point in the competition? Um, and so I think that that's, I mean, in some ways, I think that's the crux of the question. Uh, and we've actually, history provides a number of different uh, outputs. Um, I stumbled into an old Barry Posen article yesterday while I was working on things, and one of the points that, that he made, and I'm not usually inclined to quote a lot of Barry Posen points, uh, is you know, the Soviet Union was never that large of an economy. It was not a sophisticated country. They just translated huge amounts of economic output into military strength. That's a political choice. And so how do we think about those kinds of political choices? How will various states make those political choices uh, as this competition evolves? And maybe as sort of a coda, I actually think the most interesting thing is, what the, is not what the U.S. or China might do in terms of competition, but what all the other states in the system do as they watch these two kind of elephants move around the grass. Uh, so thank you for so much rich and interesting to think about. I love your point about at what point does it become zero-sum competition, because one of the fundamental tenets of, of the liberal international order is that nothing has to be zero-sum, mm -hmm. right? That everybody can win through cooperation. And so we here at the Institute spend a lot of time thinking about metrics. What are the right things to measure 
Uh, are you just measuring stuff you know how to measure as opposed to what is relevant to measure to this problem to Almost measure? Almost certainly. Um, and uh, it seems to me that one uh, important thing you haven't yet mentioned is uh, you mentioned the, the objective state of the Soviet economy, mm. but not the subjective American imagination about it. And there, I think, there are parallels between how the United States thought about the Soviet Union. Anybody who hasn't yet gone back and read the CIA estimates of the Soviet economy circa 1954 or 1955, it's fabulous reading because they imagine that within the space of three years, the Soviet economy will overtake the United States and we will be left behind in this competition. And it has a lot of the breathlessness of current talk about China. I saw the good and great Sir Lawrence Friedman here, and those of you who have not read his book, American Intelligence and the Soviet Strategic Threat, um, I would commend it to you. Uh, because he grapples with how what we know determines the nature of the threat and that in fact the less we know the more threatening things feel to us and that for me feels like a very strong parallel to the experience of the American government in the aftermath of September 11th where there was so much fear and overreaction mm -hmm. because you didn't know the nature of the threat. How do you assess our knowledge about China now? That's so a great do, question. Are we overestimating the Chinese threat because we don't know what to measure, don't know how to measure it, and therefore are acting like the CIA assessing the Soviet economy in 1954? Well, I think maybe I, there's, there's two parts to this answer. So on the one hand, we have a lot of data and data points about the, the kind of underlying Chinese economy and then parts of how that translates into their military activity. Um, although data on the Chinese economy is always pretty interesting. Um, my brother actually studied abroad in, in China and, and speaks Chinese and he did a lot of work uh, for one of his research papers on um, kind of the state level debt, the local level debt that gets issued and then whether it's forgiven or, or not by the, by the national banks. Um, the long story short of which is there's actually a huge amount of like off the books debt that's not well uh, accounted for, um, that has a lot of political meaning but is disastrous economically. Um, so there's a lot, you know, and I guess there's actually quite a bit of debate right now, like is China in the midst of a slowdown? How bad might it be? Would the Chinese government know first or last? <laughs> Which is a pretty good yeah. question. Um, I think the part that has American policy folks kind of uh, with their hair, if not quite on fire, certainly a bit smoldering, is they think they got Xi wrong. So they didn't really, Xi, President Xi was not the leader that they were, they thought they were going to get in this trajectory. So they had invested in the bilateral relationship, they had brought China you know, into um, multilateral organizations. Um, they sort of adopt this language of responsible stakeholder, and then you get um, a fair, that they maybe is a fairly revisionist leader in Xi, who both has different aims domestically in China, from what I understand, and therefore people are uncertain what his external aims may also be. And I think that is what has folks skittish, which is that there's a fear that they got something wrong and now have allowed this tiger to grow a bit too big. So since we are talking about great power competition, uh, if they had accurately assessed mm. Xi's intentions, uh, how do you imagine they should have prevented this tower, tiger from growing big? What does that look like? Yeah. Does it look like the disaggregation of supply chains that we now begin to see as a function of trade disputes between the U.S. and China, or also as a function of um, of uh, belief that the, that no Chinese company isn't a state intelligence mm -hmm. asset. That is the five G discussion, right? Um, I think you might have seen. I, on the one hand, my sort of gut answer is that I'm not sure there's much that the U.S. government could have done to change this trajectory, um, which is the sort of 
the, the odd duality of American faith and capitalism and then our deep desire to <laughs> channel it when it comes to the, on the foreign policy side. Um, so I think that there is an element where certainly there could have been greater enforcement of the actual rules, um, whether WTO or, or otherwise, steel dumping is one example, IP theft being another place. But those were always political decisions, right? So the, why, what, is, what are the pressures then for why a policymaker doesn't do that? So maybe they are afraid of um, uh, escalating something with China or damaging the relationship, but there was also a lot of domestic pressure from U.S. <laughs> companies not to disrupt the addition, you know, the, the ancillary or the additional uh, economic relationships. And so I think, yes, there was some incentive, um, and I think in retrospect, steel's probably the one that people think, oh, we probably should have leaned into that more harshly. But there were a lot, there were you know, a number of different actors who were saying, mm -hmm. well, kind of hold your tongue, let the cooperation uh, play, play out. So you mentioned economic strength and military power, mm -hmm. um, but one of the ways, one way to strengthen your case is to add the ideological element mm -hmm. into it, because one of the reasons the Cold War was so challenging was because there was an alternative ideological model that actually had a lot of positive magnetism, mm -hmm. um, even for many Americans who lived through the Great Depression right. at, or, or were, you know, uh, Hollywood screenwriters. Mm -hmm. um, and there's not a parallel in that regard. The Chinese are trying to build a parallel in that regard. Let me just parenthetically give you my favorite example of it. When I was the deputy in policy planning, Secretary Rice had a series of conversations with her Chinese counterpart in the run-up to the Beijing Olympics. And uh, the Chinese had had some bad experience here in London with uh, protesters uh, bringing to everybody's mind China's terrible human rights record and political repression. Uh, and they'd had the same experience in Paris, so they wanted to talk about how not to replicate that experience in the United States. And Secretary Rice gave them the obvious answer, which is, go to Des Moines, Iowa. <laughs> it's the nicest place in the world, and there's nothing to do there. So everybody will show up for you. They'll be so appreciative that you came to Des Moines. It'll be beautiful. The Chinese answer was, uh, no, the largest number of Chinese live in San Francisco, so we want to go to San Francisco. <laughs> and he was like, you realize those are Chinese Americans, right? And that they left for a reason. And, and by the way, the president of the United States is considered a fascist by people in San Francisco. His, car, his, his motorcade gets egged. People are gonna be wrapping themselves in Tibetan flags and bungee jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge. You do not wanna to go to San Francisco. And they came back, the third conversation was the Chinese suggesting that they bring several thousand ununiformed security personnel. <laughs> and Condi had to explain, even the President of the United States can't do that without the approval of the Governor of California, and you're never going to get the approval of the Governor of California. <laughs> The number of soft power things that the Chinese at that point still couldn't get right, mm -hmm. that is immigrants. So what we see now, the Chinese trying to use as a means of statecraft uh, a Chinese diaspora that doesn't think of themselves in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, the Chinese unwillingness to acknowledge the unwilling to play in a free society by the rules of a free society and expecting governments to assist them in that. Like you just go down the note. So soft power didn't figure in your calculus of the great power competition. Why not? That's a good question. I mean, I think, I don't know, maybe I was just trained too much as a rationalist to pay a great deal of attention to it. Um, I object that you believe rational people uh, <laughs> do not pay attention to political culture or to soft power. Well, my first job was with the Marine Corps. So if I didn't believe in political culture before then, I certainly did <laughs> after, after that. Um, I mean, I think part of what it is is that, one, it's not part of our narrative right now. 
um, there's almost no one in Washington talking about a sort of um, human rights-based foreign policy or um, sort of an American values-driven foreign policy. You hear it in certain pockets, but it's definitely not um, kind of in the, it's not the Reagan style of competition, which is, you know, shining city on the hill and, and whatnot. Um, I think it's actually kind of an interesting debate, though, which is, it's often implied, I don't always see it made starkly, which is whether or not the Chinese do have a competing ideology or system, or they're just the definition of like, you know, uh, like a vacuum. Like, Whatever system you want, we're happy to play in, um, as long as you play, as long as we have advantage, as long as we get leverage. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I still haven't figured out in my own head whether that is does have ideological content of its own or is in fact just sort of nihilistic kind of in the in the international system. Um, I think part of it too is that it's a it's a tricky moment for the Western democracies to be fully throated out there. Like what we have, guys, is the answer. Our political institutions are definitely the way that everybody should be orienting their things. Uh, we're a little back on our heels uh, on both sides of the Atlantic uh, at, at the moment. Um, but this question, you know, your point about sort of the things that the, that the Chinese often get wrong or sort of are ham-fisted about, I think you are seeing play out in parts of the Belt and Road Initiative. And so this is as they make sort of major infrastructure projects and other um, economic loans and financial agreements with countries all through Southeast Asia, Central Asia, kind of inroads there. Um, People are starting to see what it's like to interact with China on not wonderful terms. Um, and that's going to have consequences long term. We'll see how, you know, there's, we're just sort of at the beginning phase where I think we're starting to get some feedback from those states and some data on um, how those initiatives are affecting the kind of bilateral relationships where those investments have been, have been made. And there's kind of a, a debate, at least in the popular press, about like, oh, well, Belt and Road, it's like going okay versus uh, everyone is actually taking a step back and no one's sure that they really want to get into both the Chinese on road projects or dams or large economic assistance plans. Um, And I think that's part of this. They certainly have a lack of meaningful soft power. The question is, can they just buy their way out of it? Yeah. Um, So so several things. Uh, On the Belt and Road Initiative... Uh, it's true that the Chinese don't have the advantage of, of voluntary cooperation mm-hmm. from other countries to help them achieve their right. objectives. They're basically and loan so sharks. Your point about <laughs> about can they buy it? Mm-hmm. And uh, let's see, what was the name of the Treasury Secretary in Abraham Lincoln's administration from the state of Maryland that he appointed to the Supreme Court? Uh, it'll come to me in a minute. Anyway, he was from an important Maryland political Taney? family. No, thankfully not mm-hmm. Justice Taney, who made the Dred Scott decision. All that, right, that would predate him. Uh, but um, this guy uh, argued that uh, it was really frustrating to be in politics because it was the one area of business that when you buy a person, they don't stay bought. Um, <laughs> and... and that's the uh, challenge for the Chinese. We are running a big BRI study here over the course of the next year at the IISS, looking at three possible trajectories for the Belt and Road Initiative. One is if it works as advertised and you provide low interest loans to countries that can't qualify for, for, for loans from the Bretton Woods institutions or meet the or are willing to meet the transparency standards and the governance standards of many major western lenders so, and and china thereby repositions themselves in the map of trade and in value chains a second trajectory is what if as as dr simpson suggested they're just loan sharks and this is a gigantic debt for equity swap so they repossess infrastructure that they build and use it for military purposes. How does that affect um, security relationships, particularly in Asia, but also in Africa? And then the third trajectory is, what if the Chinese are smart enough to be adaptive? What if they are smart enough to see the nationalist backlash, to see the political costs they are uh, paying, and figure out um, how to navigate to a more sustainable, lower cost place. That is, 
it may become a tool to buy them into the liberal international order after all, mm -hmm. since they are seeking partnerships with Japanese construction firms to learn the practices of so so it could be that because they now need to go to uh, sovereign wealth funds from Norway and the Gulf for additional funding mm -hmm. that we can have the ability to use the salvaging of the BRI as a way to move the Chinese more into the liberal order. But I want to, before we go to questions, so start thinking of what you want to hear from Dr. Simpson. Uh, mention two advantages uh, that I think shape great power competition right now enormously, um, even though, uh, as you rightly point out, certainly our sweet provincial country is a poor um, advertiser of both allies and civil society at the moment. But the great advantage that the liberal order and the United States as its rule setter and guarantor has over the Chinese as a rising competitor is that we are not the only decision point, right? So when we fail, uh, the, how many times have we seen Time Magazine covers in the last two years of who is the new leader of the free world, right? First it was going to be Angela Merkel, then it was going to be Macron, but the Chinese have none of those kinds of conversations. They're nobody, there is no, there is no institutional order, there are no middle power countries that want to pull the Chinese order towards success in the way that we now see liberal powers trying to sustain the existing order despite America's failures. And the second thing, which my fellow double uh, I double S nerds hear from me all the time, is that the great saving grace of American society is how little our government actually controls. Mm -hmm. And so the other great advantage that, that the US but the liberal states more broadly have is that our government can make mistakes and our society can fix them. And the Chinese, because of the authoritarian nature and, and paranoia of their government, don't have other things that can pull them across the line. So just as the the United States is going to be the first country to meet its Paris Climate Accords goals because the great golden state of California <laughs> and smug Tim Cook and Michael Bloomberg's money and the beautiful city of Chicago, parenthetically Andrew and their terrible baseball teams, um, are going to meet the standard despite us withdrawing from the treaty and despite the hostility of the federal government. So how do you assess those two advantages? And then we'll go to questions. I think those are extraordinary advantages. Um, the first one though, I think is the, like, the one to watch uh, in terms of the, in the near term, which is sort of how do, um, especially NATO allies and our major non-NATO allies, so that's you know, UK, Britain, France, rest of the NATO countries as well, but on the Pacific side, South Korea, Japan, Australia, how do they play this? I don't like to, not a balancing game in terms of like actual balancing and bandwagoning, but sort of the balancing act where they continue to have economic interests and economic ties to China, but deep, long-standing, and I think profoundly meaningful military and security ties and also economic ties to the United States. Um, you are seeing this on 5G. Um, essentially, the Five Eyes countries are clearly working together to make sure that Chinese companies stay out of those telecommunication networks. Um, you are seeing it on some other kind of critical infrastructure um, or um, technology pieces. I think that's actually pretty important. It'll be interesting to see how that's sustained. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm laughing because the University of California at Berkeley uh, has once again burnished its liberal credentials <laughs> by ripping up all of their university communications infrastructure to ensure there's nothing Chinese anywhere in it. Wow. <laughs> so the vanguard once again is UC Berkeley. <laughs> um, that's an interesting approach. Um, but I think that that's going to be hard for them to sustain. Um, and I think you'll then see the question kind of to that second piece. There'll, there'll be parts of that that they get wrong, potentially. Um, there'll be places where the Chinese government um, reacts or tries to force a decision in one sphere in order to 
get something better on the other hand. Um, this point about the resilience that there are, there's basically no single point of failure on the Western side, but the Chinese are, I mean, it's just Xi, and he's made that even more so, right, by taking all three of these roles um, constitutionally you know, to, to himself. And so you see this in kind of like other technology debates, which is, you know, how is the U.S. ever going to like make you know headway on AI or these other you know newfangled technologies because we can't really invest and Silicon Valley doesn't want to work with us and you know all of these things, and then it's like obviously the Chinese are going to direct all this investment and just have you know am the most amazing killer robots, and it's like yeah I don't know it's, it's like Japan is a pretty interesting like counterexample. It turns out state directed investment works when it works, but there's they're not always great winners and like great at choosing the winners um, mm -hmm. or you get sidled with a particular winner and you're just stuck with them you know going going forward um, so I do think that 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 intersection I mean I do believe in the sort of resilience of the American economy um, I also believe that we're really good at doing things once we make up our mind that we wish to do so um, the point right now is that we haven't made up our mind that we wish to do so or what exactly it is we wish to do um, and so you know, it's kind of a question of just how severe a shift that will require for American government and society to get in gear. Um, but I think that that is, I mean, the, the, the combination of the internal diversity and the external diversity of partners is an extraordinary difference. So my friends, now is your opportunity to join this conversation. First question, over there. Please introduce yourself and your organization. Good afternoon, and thank you both so much. Uh, my name is Nick. I'm a second year graduate student at the LSE right next door. And my research concerns Chinese strategy, but from about a century ago, thinking about drawing parallels. So <laughs> discussion. Um, and thank you very much. So the one thing that seemed like a resonant theme throughout the discourse was that whether or not the, the allied West, so to speak, has kind of been sitting on its laurels and whether we're two steps behind when we really should be two steps ahead. And this reminded me of another term that's come about, which is the concept of sharp power. And the idea is that authoritarian states, particularly China and Russia, have been able to penetrate the armor of Western democracies um, and use the kind of infrastructure that would you know, theoretically support a better civilian response um, against it, either through uh, you know, information warfare, um, or through disseminating people undercover in other countries in order to spread alternative ideologies. Obviously, this kind of dialogue comes from a very specific viewpoint, and I'm not you know, making a value-based judgment, but my question is, are we in a position to respond to that? How does it, uh, and in what ways does it sort of relate to the broader debate about strategic competition now versus- Excellent the, question, Aaron. Long, but. I mean, there's certainly um, an asymmetric advantage that some of those states have, which is to take advantage of our open institutions. Um, they have very few themselves. They have state-controlled media. Um, we don't. We have a complete free-for-all. Um, I think that that, um, I mean, the, sort of the technical pieces of that aside, but actually just like the content of that, of that messaging, uh, you know, do reflect some of the kind of long-standing political tensions within these societies. I think both the U.S. and the U.K. experienced that. Obviously, we saw some election meddling on the continent as well. Um, but I actually, you know, those are things that those domestic publics actually have to grapple with as well. Um, and at least on the U.S. side, I think there's also a bit of it of having had 25 years plus of primacy and 15 years plus of kind of unresolved irregular wars have created a place where you can create those divisions a bit more, a bit more easily. Uh, so I, what I would be worried about, so I agree with the RNC answer, uh, which is that um, uh, math class isn't newly hard. Math <laughs> class has always been hard. And open societies have all sorts of easily uh, e fissures easily enough. And we react badly very often. Think about the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II, but not in Hawaii. So it happens in California, mm -hmm. where Japanese Americans are small enough in numbers that you can take their businesses. In Hawaii, it doesn't happen because they're simply too numerous. So the government actually had to do its job well and figure out who among these people is a threat to us. 
and, and how do we capitalize on the strength of our society, which is the patriotism of Japanese Americans, to sift out the people we actually need to worry about. So we know what the answer is to this problem, which is for us to be better at, at what we do. And so if we, if we manage our own internal, we should worry a lot less about that. But, but the other thing is that what I would worry about if I were the Chinese uh, premier is they have an enormous vulnerability to the insider threat, right? Because there are no means of affecting political change, because of the way that Chinese government is becoming more repressive with time, the social credit score craziness, they are going to have to worry that Every mom whose kid doesn't get an opportunity, whose only kid doesn't get an opportunity to go to college, is going to become an insider threat. And so all of the AI in the world isn't going to save you from somebody you know, cutting the cord or whatever creative, diabolical way she can find to show how much she hates her government. Whereas we just shouted in the streets like loyal Americans <laughs> do. Next question. Yes, sir. Yes. My name is Kazan, I am a member of this city. And my question is about the, the China. Hold on a second China. for a microphone so that the people who are going to stream this online can my hear you. My question is about the future of China Sea. Is that, uh, that's a big challenge. Is that, uh, <clears throat> is that um, lead to a war or a crisis or what sort of thing? The South China Sea. Yes. Yeah, this is one where I mean, certainly you had asked a question earlier, Corey, about what we U.S. should have done differently. And there's definitely a set of folks who think that enforcing red lines in the South China Sea would have been uh, a place to be more uh, aggressive. I, I mean, I, I don't have a good answer here. Um, I think it's challenging over the long term for the U.S. to insist on enforcement to a treaty that it hasn't ratified, um, which would be the Law of the Sea Treaty. Um, but I think that that's also... I mean, this is what rising powers or even smaller powers do, is they try to find ways to stay under escalation thresholds um, while still proving points. And so, to my mind, you can either give them that opportunity to continue to prove a point, um, which also involves, I mean, I think they are seeking out that confrontation, um, or you find other ways to, to move that into, the, you know, into an off-ramp. I, I guess, at a minimum level, I have a really hard time getting overly exorcised about the South China Sea and the sort of atolls and the basing. Um, other folks do, and they have some good reasons for it, but it strikes me as like the, not quite making a mountain out of a molehill, but it's certainly... Um, I get more exercised about it than you, I think, for two reasons. Um, the first is that the island building in the South China Sea has very practical military purpose, mm -hmm. which is dramatically complicating our ability to protect our allies in the first island chain um, and driving the cost up to us of doing that. And, and so the second thing is though, it's a perfect case for all the reasons Aaron mentioned uh, to practice tolerance warfare and to see if you can drive a wedge between the U.S. and its allies by saying, but this is just a teeny little infraction. We don't need to do anything about it, which is what, as Dr. Simpson rightly pointed out, we have been doing with the construction of the islands rather than um, preventing, destroying them, uh, occupying them in conjunction with allies, lots of different ways you could react to this. And what we, the signal we are sending to the Chinese is that we are more risk averse than you are. And that's a terrible signal to send to a rising power that is militarizing disputes. I have two theories of what's going on here that I am, uh, that I am testing for data. One is that the, that President Xi is worried about political support of the military and is therefore letting them have mm -hmm. a lot of operational latitude because he's worried about them as an internal challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this may partly explain why he's doing parades and camouflage fatigues and things like that. Um, the second is that um, the Chinese leadership may be trying to 
as the argument for their for the legitimacy of their political control, that is, continued economic dynamism, begins to show some stress that they may be trying to stoke nationalism as a substitute. But the last thing I will say is that the Chinese actually look pretty risk averse to me, that when challenged, um, I think they don't want to fight a war they're not going to win. And it looks to me like in confrontations, um, we can find we can find ways out of them. So I'm I'm less worried about it being explosive. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yep, you. Hi, uh, Ian Burns from MNC Saatchi. Um, I think there's because of the global competition between China and the U.S. There's probably a lot of people, given how many factors there are that are quite confused about which one they should side with, particularly in countries like the Philippines or many African mm. countries, um, and particularly where the US influence is waning. Um, what would you say is the key argument for either side, actually, if you were talking to someone and said why they should either side with the US or side with China? Because there's so many different options. I'm curious to know what your priority would be. I mean, it kind of depends. I mean, at some level, my background's actually in irregular warfare originally, right? And so civilians in a, a violent conflict have lots of survival strategies, coping strategies. And many of them are all variations on avoiding that exact choice, right? So you might you know, send one son to the Taliban and one son to the government you know, to, to be in the, in the national army. Um, you might avoid, you know, sort of shirk or avoid confrontation, you know, in your sort of your daily life. So a lot of those states are not going to make a choice. They're going to iterate over a series of choices so they can hedge over time, right? Which is the advantage of being a genuinely small power, right? It's actually, as I was saying before, these kind of middle powers who aren't going to have that option, at least not indefinitely, right? So Australia is obviously a, a major ally of, of the United States, a key trading partner of China. I mean, they're, they're forced into, uh, if not today, I mean, they know their long-term security arrangements depend on the United States, right? Uh, they're also sort of worried about getting dragged into a conflict in the South China Sea, which they're not super excited about. Um, but I think that, you, you know, the argument you make, I think, on the, on the U.S. side is one that's more closely about long-term fair play. Um, these are the actual global rules. If you participate in our system, you'll be more able to access a variety of other institutions and institutional partners. Um, Dollar-denominated economies you know, have more robustness you know, globally. Um, might be accessed then to all the soft power elements that we discussed you know, before, including American higher education, uh, which still is a huge draw as long as we issue the visas. Um, I think that, you know, that sort of vision of it. The Chinese you know, pitch is sort of, forget all that. You got cash. Um, and we're not a great deal of, you know, you run your government however you like. Um, and it's much more, I think, sort of near term and transactional. Um, and so that's, you know, if you have domestic political institutions that have near-term and transactional threats, uh, whether domestically or internationally, um, you might desire those, those near-term solutions. The only thing I would add to Aaron's excellent answer is that if I were the Chinese, I would be saying, aren't you sick and tired of American hypocrisy? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and they are not what they say they are. They are no different than us. Um, and you can make a pretty good case on near-term data uh, that if you don't imagine the U.S. reverts to the norm or if you just listen to the noise of our big loud arguments, who wants that? If you're not American, most people don't want that. Um, and so I would add that onto the list. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Sophie McCormack, I'm from the University of Exeter. Um, my question for you uh, would be, you've mentioned about um, selective measuring, and my biggest concern on this topic is that we're looking at it still through a primarily conventional lens. Um, what happens if we're misunderstanding the nature of China's global dominance? So if we look at their Falcon Road Initiative and their loans without bread and woods um, conditions, um, what happens if yeah, we're completely misunderstanding their nature of their global dominance 
and by waiting for some form of military conflict, we're actually completely missing the boat? It's a fabulous question. And that would be a real bummer. Uh, <laughs> so, it's a technical uh, term. The, the key to American military success is that we're not good at having it right, we're good at getting it right. Mm. So, you know, the start of World War II, we have no idea who's, despite George Marshall spending 10 years culling the army leadership, it's still really hard to tell who's gonna be good at fighting this kind of war. And so we're lucky we have North Africa before we start fighting in Europe. Uh, if you look at counterinsurgency, right? How did we not think that a weak adversary would choose a counterinsurgency strategy against us in 2001 and 2003? Um, uh, so one possible answer is pray for time, right? Because if you have time, liberal societies are good at adaptation, right? That, that's what we do well. And it looks like we have time. For all of the folks who say that the Chinese are brilliant 100-year time horizon strategists, you must answer the question, if they're so smart, why do they trigger the antibodies to their continued rise when per capita GDP is only $8,800? And 5G infrastructure decisions haven't yet been made and why are they uh, activating everybody's anxieties and pushing America's alliances into much closer uh, bonds when the United States is doing such a good job of ruining them at the moment? Um, so, so it's one more demonstration of the validity of Bismarck's comment about God having a special providence for drunks and babies in the United States of America, <laughs> that a rising power that has the real potential to be a challenge we are not the only people who make mistakes. Our adversaries make a bunch of mistakes too. And so you're right that we should be worried, do we have this wrong? Because every good strategist is a desperate paranoiac <laughs> waiting for that trap door to open underneath them and fall into the sewer below. So please be worrying about that and write for us about what we should be paying attention to that we're not. Can I give a, a narrower answer? which mm -hmm. is to say, I think actually the intelligence requirements of this kind of strategic competition are really, really important. Um, they are un the, most of the answers are unlikely to be found you know, from exquisite signals intelligence um, or highly classified means. The, nature, the answer to your question is found in foreign newspapers and open source uh, activities, what we would call open source, and a lot of the kinds of work that SSS does. These are not... Um, Secrets, they're mysteries. They're things that we're trying to unpack. Is this working? Um, there's not a government that is holding on to the answer to that question. Those foreign governments don't know either. Uh, and so figuring out how we take all the information available in the world and try to make sense of foreign economies, Chinese influence, you know, are they okay with the no strings attached or have they generated antibodies in a particular society? I think those are critical intelligence questions but they're not gonna be answered the way that we usually do intelligence analysis. And anybody who wants to get their t-shirt order in for <laughs> these are not secrets, they're mysteries, see me afterwards. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Thank you so much, that's really interesting. Um, Caroline Wallace, Department of International Trade. Um, I had a question, when you were talking about activating antibodies, I guess I was thinking back to when you were talking about the subjective and objective nature of looking at threats. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm wondering if there's a cyclical thing here where actually the level of threat perceived is impacting upon the activities that are taking place within China and outwardly, and that's why they're perhaps activating these antibodies. So I wonder what responsibility the West has in its way about talking with China, about China uh, for how it actually behaves. I mean, this was the debate in the 90s, right? Joe Nye and self-fulfilling prophecies. It was a high school debate topic, if I recall correctly. Um, there was a lot of concern that if we talked about China as a threat, it would become a threat. And I think part of the angst, at least in the US policy community at the moment, is a sort of, well, we played nice, and it turns out there's still a threat, and so now what? Uh, and I think that is sort of, people do not like to be played for a fool. 
Uh, so it's one thing to be wrong, but it's something to have been naive. And I think that is a little bit of what Scott folks goat at the moment. I too think we have tested this proposition, <laughs> right? The debate in the US now is not, is China a threat? It's why did we sustain, willfully sustain the notion that they were, could become responsible stakeholders when there was all this data, they weren't becoming responsible stakeholders. and. They didn't, you know, they had no illusions about it. We're the ones who had illusions about it. Why weren't we looking at it? Which goes back, Sophie, to your point um, about what are we not seeing when we're looking right at it. Um, anybody else? Yes, sir. Hi, my name's Holly Major of the UK Lab Wolf And we've got a ways and means conversation thus far. What if I get to push us back to ends a little bit. I'm afraid another US sporting analogy. If we make the assumption that the US is fundamentally on defense in this fight, this competition, and China is on offense, because the US has a rules-based international system it's trying to defend, how far can the US continue to defend that as a coherent end, and yet still maintain the evidence? Because the system it's trying to defend requires openness and almost requires people to be allowed to compete and challenge. And how far does the US really have a strategic end, which isn't keep everything sort of like it is now? It seems like a pretty reasonable strategic end. I was just thinking the exact <laughs> same thing. <laughs> a fundamentally conservative end, which is buy yourself time and sustain the system where you can. Um, I'm sorry, Aaron, go ahead. No, I mean, I, I, so I don't think the U.S. does grand strategy. Really? We don't have to. Those oceans are super big. Um, good and, neighbors, too. Yeah, and good neighbors, right? Um, I also, analytically, I don't know that grand strategy is, like, the most interesting thing. Even if you go in the, in the Cold War, the idea that containment was a grand strategy, it was contested domestically, it was contested in European capitals. I mean, the idea of exactly how it was to be implemented was not exactly coherent, uh, you know, in each, in each decade. Um, I, I guess I'm, I think, mostly keeping most of the rules-based order. I mean, part of this is sort of to what extent does the U.S. believe its own press? Do we think there's really a liberal rules-based order that we're committed to the idea of? Or are we committed to like getting what we want through a variety of ways of doing it and it turns out international institutions are a way of reducing a lot of transaction costs? Not really a realist, but reducing transaction costs is like a pretty easy way to go about doing things. Um, I think you know the question is sort of, will China try to change rules within those systems or where they try to blow up the actual systems, right? And or create something competing. Turns out it's really a, it's really hard to create an entire like rules-based order and sustain it on the back of your economic growth for 60 plus years. I don't see the Chinese having any of the wherewithal to to do that, much less the compelling soft power or ideological content to bring folks uh, with them. Um, but I'm a little I'm less inclined to drink our own bathwater on this than some of the advocates. Um, there should be, you know, there's a good set of international institutions that mostly help our allies and ourselves. I think we should sustain those. Um, but the idea that the, the liberal order in and of itself is the end, I'm less compelled by. Uh, on, the, uh, on the grand strategy question, uh, Shockey's theory of grand strategy is you should never adopt one that's fundamentally inconsistent with who you are as a political culture. And so openness is who we are and, and therefore trying to sustain a strategy whereby the American government magically implements a Goldwater Nichols for the interagency <laughs> and all, everybody starts pulling together to common purpose. Like, that's not only not who we are, it's not who we ever wanted ourselves to be, right? There's a reason the American government is set up with a competition for power. It was designed by people who fundamentally distrusted power. Um, and so I think we're not doing nearly a good enough job of leaning into our own strengths. And instead of saying, ah, oh, geez, we gotta get strategic communications right. Instead, 
you know, why not social media swarming? How is it we're losing the social media high, high ground to countries that aren't free societies? Um, we ought to think more about those kinds of questions, about why are we not succeeding on our own terms, rather than how, our, how we could adopt our adversaries' approaches. Which takes us to you, Mitch. Hi, Mitch Mitchell. I'm the Director of Ministry of Defence's Internal Think Tank. Um, so in that uh, playing field just to strive, where we want to continue to win 5-0. Maybe 5-1, but 5 nil is great. So how do we deal with existential threats like environment, mm -hmm. like demography? How, like space and what we do with space, and how we live and breathe on this society if we destroy the environment? How do we deal with those issues if we're going to keep looking for a 5 nil? I think that's a great question. Um, you know, sometimes... Going back to this sort of liberal order discussion, um, we forget, and it's easy to do so, how many of those institutions got built or why there became both um, theories of political science but also political ideologies that were committed to kind of multilateral responses and multinational uh, institutions, one of which is that there were multinational problems, right? That like that there were tragedy of the commons issues, that if we all pursued, you know, individual best outcomes, everybody would be worse off. And so we needed a way to aggregate those interests, smooth out the side payments, and, you know, bring a set of folks together, at least on some technical solutions to things. Um, I think that climate is actually still a place where there's a great deal of opportunity to cooperate with China, but also other countries. Um, migration is also an interesting challenge. Those things are deeply interrelated, obviously. Um, the Chinese being sort of, um, not narrow-minded, but deeply focused on their self-interest can be motivated by their deep suspicion of self-interest. Uh, and I think that climate and some of those issues that you're talking about provide some opportunities to do so. But it's not the case that, I mean, those, those agreements don't magically happen, right? I mean, those are require a great deal of diplomatic effort, they require a great deal of political effort to sustain, and the technical bases for them um, are not always obvious to, to all the players. So I think that that's, um, I'd love to see more focus sort of on that as a place of, um, you might be able to generate some useful interactions, because um, I think that we haven't really talked much about conflict, which is good, because competition is actually quite distinct from, from conflict, but I think it's actually very important to have both institutional and interpersonal off-ramps for the U.S. and China so that when tensions do rise and things begin to escalate, there are ways to keep them from becoming active conflicts. And having channels and institutions in these other plays are one way that you might be able to help manage that. That is a fabulous note on which to end this conversation. I would like not only to thank Dr. Simpson, but also to thank all of you. This place thrives because of your intellectual engagement with it. Thank you for showing up today. Thank you for thinking about these hard <coughs> issues with us. Thank you for coming to the Double I Double S.